for salvation is nearer to us. That's a sort of puzzling statement in a way, isn't it? The time factor in this age is difficult to comprehend because Paul wrote as if the coming of the Lord was very close. I'll give you my personal understanding. This is not doctrine. This is just Brother Prince. And if it helps you, praise God. If it doesn't, don't get angry with me. But you see, there are some benefits in having been a philosopher. And one of the things that philosophers always ponder about is time. And time remains a mystery in spite of Einstein. Nobody has really plumbed the depths of what time is. But I want to suggest to you that when a true believer dies and passes out of this life, he passes into a timeless existence. Eternity is not subject to the laws of time. We are no longer having elapsed time. There are no clocks in that world that we go to. And his body is laid in the tomb and decomposes. So he closes his eyes in death, moves out into a timeless uh, existence. And his eyes are not going to open until when? The resurrection. This blesses me so much, I hope it will bless you. And when he opens those eyes in his resurrected body, what's the first thing he'll see? The Lord coming in power. So you are never further from the Lord's coming in time than you are from your point of death. You see what I'm saying? Because after that, there's not time for you. This excites me. I don't know whether it excites you. I've pondered on it a lot. It also excites me that when I open these eyes with a resurrected, glorified body, the first thing my eyes are going to look at is Jesus in his glory, in his power. If you're not excited about that, you should be a Britisher. You know how excitable we are. And I was, after all, brought up an Anglican. <laughs> but I get excited when I think about the Lord's return. And that really is the thing that motivates me to live the Christian life. I'm going to see Jesus in his glory. I'm going to see his kingdom established on earth. That's the only solution to the innumerable problems of humanity. We can do a little bit of good, we can open hospitals, we can start schools, but evil actually seems to outrun good in this present day. I'm not sure whether humanity is better off in the 20th century than it was in the first. If you measure all the different problems that confront us today, I am naive enough to believe that the only solution to humans' problems humanity's problem is the establishment of God's kingdom on earth and that was the thing that Jesus taught us to pray for every time we pray thy kingdom come thy will be done where on earth a lot of Christians have got the attitude that our aim is to get to heaven well I have to say it's a tremendous privilege to believe that you're going to go to heaven when you die but that isn't my aim and it wasn't Paul's aim Look for a moment in Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. Philippians 3, beginning at verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish in order that I may, may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. We all say amen to that, don't we? What about the next verse? The next words. And the fellowship of his suffering. 
being conformed to his death, in order that I may get to heaven. Is that what he said? In order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection is our goal, not heaven. We, when we are in heaven, our spirits will be there, but our bodies will be decomposed. And that's not the end of salvation. Jesus has purchased spirit, soul, and body. And Paul says, I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body may be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, you can say Paul was naive or Peter was naive. I say no. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit showed them that they'd have that much time and then they'd see the Lord. And while we spend centuries here on earth, they're in a timeless existence. It's hard for the human mind to, to conceive that, but I believe it's established fact. So now in the light of that, let's go back to Romans 13. Romans 13. Verse 11 and following. This do, that is, keep all these instructions, knowing the time, that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone. The day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day and not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality and not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. That's a picture of people who are living in excited anticipation of the Lord's return. The motivation for holy living is not a set of rules. It's the fact we're going to meet Jesus. I'm a country boy. I'm from West Virginia. I don't know nothing about this big time stuff. I just, I never even asked to be big. I wanted to be effective, not famous. Famous is the consequences of being effective. I didn't know nothing about being famous and I didn't like it. And so there I was. And when you first knew, Everybody attacks you first and figures you out later. And the first time I was in the Washington Post, the article was so vicious it made me nauseous. I was so shocked that you could say that stuff about somebody you didn't even know based on assumptions and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. They piece it all together and you don't get to say anything back. So I decided I don't want this. I was preaching for Pastor Bishop Donnie Mears, and I was nobody knew it because preachers can override their feelings and function. I preached the place was on fire, but inside I wanted to quit. I told God, I'm through with this. I'm not going through this. I don't need this. I don't see. I don't need that. I'm, I'm a guy who likes to go get his own chicken wings. I don't have to have all of that stuff to be happy. So I said, I'm not doing this no more. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this because I don't need this and I didn't ask for this. I'm only doing this because of, of what happened in my life, of the circumstances that happened in my life. He put me on stage. I didn't ask for it. And when I saw how much it cost, I thought, you can have that right back here. You can have that right back up in here. I don't need it. So I was mad inside. I was hurt. And, uh, 
I stayed up in the fellowship with the pastors because I didn't want to go back to my room and sulk in my own sorrows. And they said, there's a lady down the stairs waiting to see you. The service was over and the fellowship was over. The pastor started to leave. I was trying to outweigh her. I thought she'd give up and leave. And when I finally came down the steps, she was there. And she was just a really wee bit of a woman. And uh, she said, Bishop Jacks, she said, uh, I've been in the hospital. She said, uh, I was pregnant in my fallopian tubes. And the baby died in my tubes. And I was carrying around a dead baby. And the toxicity from the baby almost killed.
60 years old, and I, everybody who works for me is younger than me, and they'll tell you, I'll work you up under the table. Come on. I'll work you up under the table. Where does that come from? My father. My father. Absolutely. My father is real. My, let me tell you, this chair is about to break. <laughs> My father's sitting here, and my mother is sitting here, and they're fighting for the mic from moment to moment. My grandmother talks to you every now and then. All of my ancestors are sitting on this table all the way back to Nigeria. So all the way back in my DNA, we were self-sufficient. And all of them are sitting here, folks whose name I can't even call. So what we're talking about is culture, okay, and not, not racial culture, family culture. Where, where the demonstration of what my father decided what grinding was. <laughs> you weren't grinding till daddy said you were grinding. Gotcha. <laughs> Take your hands out your pocket, boy, like you got a million dollars in your pocket. They trained us not to be lazy. They talked about lazy like it was a disease. It doesn't matter where you start. It matters where you finish. I'm, I'm going to drop some on you. It takes courage to be successful. It's far easier not to be successful. Misery will always have company. Success breeds contempt. If you don't want to make waves, be mediocre. Be normal and fit in. And if you're more concerned about people than you are God, then neutralize everything he put in you. Just fit in with everybody else. Dress like them. Walk like them.
dreamer? I say, are you a dreamer? I say, are you a dreamer? It's very, very important that you understand the things that I'm sharing with you today. I feel like I'm a man on a mission. I feel like God sent me to you for a reason. I am pregnant to deliver this word. Every time I get this word out, I feel a little bit better. Somebody needs this word. Somebody's life is going to be changed today. Somebody's on the verge of going to another level. You've been held up and held back and hindered by people who didn't understand where you were coming from because they didn't see it and they didn't perceive it and they didn't understand it. But God is getting ready to do something new and something fresh and something significant in your life. Oh, do you hear what I'm saying? If you're going to be effective, number one, you must identify the source of your dream. You must identify the source of your dream. Where did your dream come from? important that you understand it because some of us have inherited dreams from from parents and 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 and, and mentors and people who wanted to influence us and people who wanted to live vicariously through you so they start pointing you toward what they think you ought to do and and, and if your dream is born through somebody else's desire you could be destroyed trying to fulfill it People always wanted a doctor in their family, and they always wanted a dentist in their family, and they always wanted a lawyer in their family, and so they decide they're going to steer you in that direction, and you're miserable trying to be something for which God didn't really call you to do, and you weren't created to do it, and you're frustrated trying to do something that's really not you. Somebody who wants grandkids before they die, and so you go out and marry somebody and get pregnant so mama can see her grandkids, and you end up miserable for 30 years to fulfill somebody else's dream of being. Oh, grandma says you got a preacher's head, and everybody's are sending you to Bible college and you end up preaching for 20 years, but you're miserable and out of place because you really haven't fulfilled your dream. You've received the dream from other people. Domineering, overbearing, manipulative people who speak into your life and control you. Domineering husbands, domineering wives, manipulative people who try to make you be happy to be something that they want you to be and you're living out somebody else's dream. And as long as you're living out somebody else's dream, you are a prisoner, a slave to their imagination. the source of your dream when you're identifying the source of your dream you got to rule out dreams that are born out of brokenness dreams that are born out of bad beginnings you're trying to prove something to your first husband you're trying to show your first boyfriend that you can live without him you're trying to show your sister that you made it without her support you're trying to prove something to the neighbors across the street you've been through abuse and you're trying to get even with life for something that it took you through all these things are dreams that are not good dreams they, they're nightmares they, they end in agony and despair because they were not born correctly these dreams are born out of the flesh they're born out of flesh issues and problems that take hold in your life and they're born because you're trying to prove something to somebody who may not ever change their mind in the first place you cannot allow somebody's opinion to become your idol can you handle this you got to rule out dreams that are born out of your own fleshly desire to be seen to be heard to be recognized to be different to be impressive to be accepted. Oh, it's getting tight now. This requires deep honesty. I mean, you might spend a year or two just going through this first point. Because it really takes some nerve to look yourself in the, in the face and say, why am I doing this? And I mean, really be honest. Strip off all the little scriptures you wrapped around what you wanted to do and take a good naked look at why are you really doing this. If you don't get the nerve to ask yourself the tough question about where your dream came from, you're going to end up in a nightmare. Like Sarah, who ends up with an Ishmael by a woman that she later has to put out of her house because the whole thing was born out of the flesh. And God told Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless you, but I'm not going to bless you through anything that was born out of your flesh, born out of your pride, born out of your 
Christ. Going out of your need to be recognized. And some people need to understand that your life has been put on hold for years. The enemy couldn't stop you from going forward, but he let you have an Ishmael because he comes for three things. He comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And if he can't destroy you, he'll try to steal your life away from you, get you to spend your life trying to do something that is not going to be profitable. And the worst kind of servant you can be in the house of God is an unprofitable servant. Profit is what you have left when the transaction is over. You got to write fast because I'm loaded today, baby. Profit is what you have left when the transaction is over. And when you start seeing years pass by and you don't have anything to profit, you've got to get the nerve to look at your dream and say, why am I doing what I'm doing? And ask yourself the tough questions so that you don't try to get the promise to an Israel. to make it happen. 
And you've got to resolve within yourself that I can do this, that it's hard. But you've got to say, I'm the one. When you have a dream, you're going to have some detractors. People will get jealous, try to make you look bad, try to talk you out of it. Say things like, you really think you can get that promotion? You don't have the experience, the talent. I don't think so. Let that go in one ear and out the other. People don't determine your destiny. I say this respectfully, but sometimes your relatives won't celebrate you. Sometimes the people closest to you will be the least supportive. Don't get distracted fighting battles that don't matter. Trying to prove to them who you are. Trying to convince them how they should be for you. You don't need their approval. You what stirs them up is the fact that you're moving forward, pursuing your destiny. They would love to convince you to keep your dream buried so you don't rise higher and make them look bad. They don't realize God has put dreams in them. If they would stir it up, they could fulfill their purpose. Successful people, people that have a dream, don't waste their valuable time looking at what everybody else is doing. They're too busy focused on what God has put in their own heart. Bottom line, the enemy targets people who have a dream. He'll use opposition, discouragement, delays, jealousy, everything he can to try to convince you to bury that dream. If you're going to reach your highest potential, you have to make up your mind that you are in it for the long haul. You're not going to let people talk you out of it. Circumstances discourage you. Delays cause you to give up. Critical people cause you to get distracted. You're going to stay focused on your goal. Look, ain't no more talking. This is it. If you ready to take your game to the next level in whatever it is, sports, life, business, whatever it is, health, listen to me very closely. You got to change that mindset. Somebody came up to me. They said, E.T., man, I'm tired, E.T. I'm tired, E.T. I put in the work, E.T. I'm not seeing the results, E.T. I'm ready to give up, E. I'm ready to give in, E. I did what you told me to do. I read the book you told me to read. I put in the hours you told me to put in. E, I'm doing it, and I'm not seeing anything. My why is every single day when I wake up, every minute of the day, every hour of the day, I have an opportunity. Somebody who quit, somebody who gave up, somebody who stopped in life. I have the power as my nickname, the refresher. I have the power as the refresher to make you believe again, to make you get up when you got up three times and you say, I'm not getting up no more. When you get to the point where enough is enough, when you get to the point where it hurt real bad, when you get to the point you can't take it no more, when you get to that point, I'm telling you, I can't explain it to you. The doors start opening, opportunities start happening. But what you cannot do is you cannot quit doing the process. Wow, wow, wow. I'm about to wrap this thing up. This is to me. You can't make a difference until you make a decision.